uh, I want to introduce you to uh, Lee Snyder. He was he was also uh, at uh, the the last meetup we had. Uh, it was a very a very nice meetup, I think, in in the the Ridderzaal in the Hague. Um, all the way from New York, uh, and uh, he's been in the, the blockchain, in the ICO, in, the, in, in investigating how this legal stuff uh, works and how the market will change for a long time. And I've, I've enjoyed every conversation with him about that. Uh, and I think it's, it's um, well, I don't want to raise the bar too much, but I think it's, it's, about, it's about the first time in, in such an audience uh, in the Netherlands, we're combining uh, the, the, the topic of the legal space and blockchain together. So uh, it's an honor to have you uh, here, uh, Lee, and uh, please uh, a warm hand of applause for Lee Snyder. <laughs> uh, uh, first opening keynote. Thank you. Uh, you have to take it. Thank you, Rutger. Thank you all for coming today. This is a great event. I think Rutger's idea around having many people come and talk about the legal issues associated with blockchain is very important because the legal issues, the regulatory issues are still being thought through, they're still being developed. And uh, as Rutger pointed out, we do have a legal stack, uh, but most of our legal stack is not very technology oriented uh, other than the gray matter technology that we all have built in here. Uh, so part of my goal is to introduce people to thinking about the legal issues and the regulatory issues. So what I'd like to do today is to talk about, well, I developed a catchy title. It's AI, IoT, and blockchain, thoughts on contextual regulation. AI, artificial intelligence, IoT, internet of things, and blockchain. I'm actually not gonna talk about AI and IoT too much today, but I think the principles that I lay out with respect to contextual regulation for blockchain will apply to those technologies as well. And we're starting to see many IoT projects look at blockchain as a very useful infrastructure. Many AI projects look at blockchain as part of their infrastructure or technology stack. So please keep that in mind while I talk today. Um, before I, I really get started, I, I just wanted to make two points about the blockchain community. Uh, the, those two points are one, that it really is a community. We're seeing people from all over the globe embracing blockchain and looking at blockchain to create solutions for everyday problems as well as for sort of more esoteric problems. And I, for one, think that sense of community is really terrific. The second thing I want to emphasize is there's a huge amount of creativity within that community. And to me, that's what makes my work so exciting is talking with projects that are thinking creatively about how to apply blockchain to different problems. So we should all bring that sense of community and that sense of creativity to our thinking about the laws behind, uh, behind projects and the regulation of these projects. So please keep those important ideas in mind as well. I'm gonna sort of cover four themes today. One theme is that blockchain or distributed ledger technology is a technology, it's not an industry. I think many people get into this concept of blockchain as an industry as if it were sort of this homogeneous group of people doing homogeneous things. Obviously that's not the case because we see so many different forms of implementation. The second theme I wanna talk about is it's a potentially revolutionary technology and therefore it has applications, infrastructural applications, in many industries. So while it itself is not an industry, we expect to see it applied to many different industries. The impacts on financial services is just one isolated example of that. And I'll talk a little bit more later about some other areas that we're seeing things in. But again, think about that creativity that people are bringing to bear here. You're seeing it in many ways. And the last thing I wanna stress is that my concept of contextual regulation. Contextual regulation, and I'll explain that a little bit more detail later, uh, should apply to blockchain and other new technologies because if you divorce the context from which the technology, or in which the technology is being used, you can't think intelligently about how to regulate it. So let's remember what blockchain is. I always start off with this. Um, 
in part to remind myself because it's important to think about sort of first principles here. So we think about blockchain. Blockchain is a distributed uh, ledger that is across multiple computers that allows for digitization of assets. And when I start talking with uh, people who are novices in blockchain about what a ledger is and why digitization of assets is cool, people sort of don't get it at first. And the idea that you can take any asset and make it digital, and that makes it so much easier to transact in that asset is astonishing. And we need to remember how astonishing that is because, because of that nature, it can be used in all these different industries. So blockchain avoids the double spend problem. If I know that I have the one token that represents that asset, then I don't have to worry about its provenance. I don't have to worry that it's been bought by somebody else and the person who buys it for me doesn't need to worry that I've sold it to somebody else. And then, of course, as I just said, blockchain has applications across many different uh, air areas. So what are blockchain tokens? Blockchain tokens are exactly that digitization of the asset. And we should think about assets in a very broad sense. So I actually say it's a digital representation of an asset, data, information, or other item on a blockchain. The projects that I'm seeing, the projects that many of us are seeing throughout the industry are thinking very creatively about what can be an asset that can be tokenized and put on a blockchain. And that's very important to remember again because it has the applications across many different industries. So any asset can be tokenized. We can talk about intangible assets like shares of stock or intellectual property rights. I know some people are looking at this for the music industry, for the movie industry. Those are great examples of intangible assets. We can think about it for physical assets. An ounce of gold, a bushel of wheat, any other type of physical asset can be tokenized and traded on a blockchain. And we can also think about it for intangible assets that are purely digital in nature, those assets that are created specifically for a particular blockchain. Bitcoin is a perfect example of that. But again, it goes way beyond that, the, these types of sort of traditional assets that people think about because it's such a convenient way to transfer and trade anything. So who creates blockchains and blockchain tokens and why? Well, because of the technological flexibility, blockchains are created for many purposes. And blockchain tokens can exist on the blockchain simply to be traded or they can also exist to drive the platform or drive network effects on the platform. So blockchain will change the world. I've, I've got some quotes here from some famous folks who, uh, who think, think they see various futures for blockchain. Uh, um, Richard Branson, uh, who you'll see, uh, uh, I'll talk about in a minute on the next slide, he in particular has hosted a couple of events now about blockchain. Uh, and is looking at ways, apparently, for blockchain to change things in his companies. You can transfer the ownership of an asset or access to data or information. So everything that you're describing could be done on the Bitcoin blockchain. The same way I, I, I can send a text message, now I can send value. That means that every last person in the world becomes part of one synchronous system. In general, uh, with every promise of revolutionary change, there are vested interests that are going to cringe and, and be afraid. We can push uh, this technology into new sectors. We can push this technology into new geographies. Uh, and in doing so, I think we can have a very positive impact on the world. I think there's every possibility that it's going to be a pervasive technology that touches a lot of mankind. So those are some quotes from uh, the event that he hosted in 2016 on his private island. I was not invited to that event, much to my chagrin. And uh, if I ever see Mr. Bran Sir Branson, sorry, um, I'll take it up with him personally. But uh, look, he had a lot of really forward-thinking people at that event, and they were talking about 
many different ways, many different applications for blockchain. And it's important for us to, again, keep this in mind when we think about the regulatory side of things. So just to talk about some examples from my own experience, you know, I've spoken with people in the automotive industry. There's applications for blockchain with self-driving cars, for auto insurance, uh, and, and other things in the automotive industry. Healthcare in the US, as many of you probably know, we have this sort of scattered, kind of a little crazy and idiosyncratic healthcare system that's getting even crazier and more idiosyncratic uh, these days. Um, but many people are looking at blockchains to help with the delivery of healthcare, with the monitoring of ongoing treatment, um, and also for healthcare records. Transportability of healthcare records on a blockchain is, is a really interesting and cool concept. Control of personal data. Certainly when GDPR comes into effect next year in the European Union, uh, blockchain is going to have some really interesting implications and applications there. But anybody who wants to control their, their personal data, self-sovereign identity is, is something that people talk a lot about, will benefit from blockchain applications. Financial services, here we're hosted by, um, by um, AFM. Obviously, they are interested in financial services, and many people have spoken about the applications there, particularly uh, with regard to payment processing is a big one that, that I hear a lot of. Uh, filmmaking, I'm working with a project right now that wants to support independent filmmaking through the blockchain technology. That will just be one piece of the, of the technology stack that they'll use, but it will be a way for people to uh, access independent filmmaking in the U.S. to be able to view independent movies. And event ticketing, another project we're working with is, is going to try to change event ticketing uh, in the U.S. and the world so that people are able to buy tickets and attend events that they want in a much easier fashion. So the regulatory issues. This is an area that's still in development from a legal and regulatory standpoint. Um, the applicable regulatory regime will depend on the industry and on the token's features. Uh, that includes the assets that are represented by the token on the blockchain. Whether a token is a security is an issue that many people talk about, but it's only one issue here. Uh, I gained some uh, attention for some of the work that I've done on this issue in the United States, but I think it's very important to remind everybody that that is not the only regulatory issue here. There are many regulatory issues. And this is where we get to the concept of contextual regulation. So what does contextual regulation mean? To me, it's defined as determining which regulatory regime or regimes apply based on the context in which the technology is used. And that context can be both at the industry level and at the country level. The industry level is very important. Just to give a couple of quick examples, uh, we talked a moment ago about healthcare applications. In the US, there's significant regulation around the delivery of healthcare. There's significant regulation around the privacy of healthcare records. If a blockchain project does not keep that in mind when they're designing how the project will work, they will run afoul of the healthcare regulations, regardless of whether or not their token is a security, regardless of how they raise their money. The same is true in the automotive industry, which is regulated very differently from the healthcare industry because obviously there are two very different things that are getting done there. And the same holds true for any other industry that we talk about. We already have contextual regulation throughout the world. We do it on a country by country basis. Different countries regulate different activities in different ways. We also do it on an industry by industry basis within countries. So I'm not, I think, proposing something that is earth shattering or groundbreaking. Hopefully I'm reminding everybody of what they already know, which is that the context in which you're using the technology informs the regulation that will apply. It doesn't mean we don't necessarily need some new regulation. It doesn't necessarily mean we shouldn't be thinking about how to make regulation better but it does mean that we need to look at the context before we decide what regulation applies. 
Another concept that I want to talk about is first principles. When we talk about, or when I talk about contextual regulation, I think that there are a few principles that we should agree upon with respect to how we're going to regulate something. And I've tried to articulate them here. Context is important. I hope I've just showed you that. Don't commit fraud. It's amazing how many people uh, laugh when I tell them not to commit fraud. I think most people are not intending to commit fraud, but look, it's a serious issue. There are fraud statutes and fraud laws uh, in every jurisdiction. And when you're implementing a new technology, regardless of the industry, you want to make sure that you're, you are appropriately transparent, um, which you see is my, my next issue there. Um, and appropriate transparency will help go a long way to, to preventing fraud. But you, you want to create an environment where people are informed and making good decisions about the technology and about how it's being used. And then the last first principle that I will propose is global coordination. One thing that blockchain it clearly does is it operates on a global basis. It's not bounded by country borders. And I do think it's very important for regulators and industry participants around the globe to be talking about these issues, to be thinking through how they want to regulate how they want to approach projects, and how those projects will be delivered to the public uh, on a global basis. Otherwise, we'll just be in a situation where people will be endlessly trying to comply with many different regulations, some of which are contradictory or overlapping in inconvenient ways that will stifle the technology rather than help the technology. So thank you very much for taking some time to, to listen. Uh, I very much appreciate uh, being here, the invitation. Thank you all very much, and uh, look forward to hearing everybody on the panels and everyone's questions today. Thank you.